All right, welcome everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the second event of our fall 2018 Solkov Work of Literary Merit series on Octavia Butler's novel Kindred. I just want to remind everyone uh, that uh, tomorrow afternoon from 4 to 6, we have a panel discussion uh, that will feature uh, Ann Goldman, uh, faculty from Sonoma State, and also our own uh, Dr. Michael Hale and Abby Bogomolny, uh, who will all be presenting uh, various views on the novel and discussing uh, those with each other. And of course, as usual, there'll be time for question and answer. And as always, we uh, want to send out a special thanks to the Robert C. Kelly Literary Works Endowment for their ongoing support of this series. Our speaker today is John Kinchelow from Napa College, and he is going to be giving a, a talk on the time travel aspect in Butler's novel. I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, wonderful things to explore there. John, uh, of course, is a California fellow. He's from Chico originally, he later attended uh, UC Santa Barbara, uh, and graduated in 2007 with his bachelor's in psychology and a minor in English. After graduating, he taught for a while, uh, I think about a year in Japan uh, with the the, the JET program, and then he came back here to California, working in the various capacities at local schools, ended up getting a master's degree in English from Sonoma State University in 2014. And then uh, after, at that point, he's been teaching at various colleges in the area, at uh, Sonoma State, Santa Rosa Junior College, Chabot College, College of Marin, and uh, of course, this past year, many of you may know him uh, from uh, being one of our full-time faculty members who was uh, doing a temporary one-year leave replacement. And uh, as of this year, he's doing his first year uh, in tenure review uh, at Napa College, <clears throat> at Napa Valley College in the English department. <clears throat> his passions in English education are development of academic writing and critical thinking, the power and utility of technology, media, and their applications in the classroom and beyond human rights, and a diversity of authors and voices, as well as the rich worlds of science fiction and fantasy literature. Please join me in welcoming John Kinchelow back to Santa Rosa Junior College. OK. Can we hear me? OK. Um, you know, first of all, like uh, Matt said, my name is John Kinchlow. Um, first of all, I want to thank Matt. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to thank the, the WOM committee, Abby and the whole WOM committee, for allowing me to do this today and inviting me to uh, come back and share some of my ideas. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Robert Holcomb and the Arts and Lectures Program for co-sponsoring this event. Um, so exciting to get this opportunity to come back and talk to you guys about one of my favorite novels, Octavia Butler's Kindred, and uh, just some of my wacky ideas about time travel. So, so last night I had a dream. In this dream, um, my, my son and I are sitting uh, in a room on the floor together. And we're kind of looking at each other. Actually, actually it was this room, I think. So we're sitting in, in this room on this stage on the floor looking at each other, and he's kind of babbling and smiling like he does and just melting my heart, and I'm talking to him and, and everything. And my son was born on March 29th, so he's almost six, seven months old now. I'm on March 28th, excuse me. <laughs> it says it right there. Um, and I was born in 1985 in Chico. And as we're sitting there, um, we look up, and a group of men walk in the room. And they walk in one at a time, they don't say anything, but they just sit in this front row and they just kind of look at us. And the first one to walk in is my dad. He was born in 1948, I'm 49, gosh, in Woodland, and uh, moved to Rio Vista and then moved to Chico where he met my mother and raised me. And after him is his dad, John Ludden Kinchelow, my namesake, who was born in 1921 in Woodland and moved to Rio Vista to raise a family. And then after him is his dad, Zachariah, Zachariah Benson Kinchelow, who's my father's namesake, who was born in 1890 in Woodland. And after him was his dad, John Marshall Kinchelow, who was also born in Woodland in 1866 as the Civil War came to a close. And after him was his dad, 
Zachariah Benson Kinchel I, who was born in 1823 in Missouri and moved his family out west in, on a wagon train to find a better life during the gold rush. And then another group of men came in, and this time they were all born in Virginia. So there was Joseph Kinchelo, who was born in Virginia in 1783 and moved his family to Missouri to find a better life. And then there was Thomas Ludwell Kinchelo, born in 1761. Lieutenant Captain William Kinchelo Sr., who was born in Virginia in 1736, actually served in the Revolutionary War and was part of a, a team that built a fort in Kentucky, where he eventually passed away. And then John Kinchelow Sr., who was born in 1694 and was actually the first of the Kinchelow line to be born in America. And then the last two people that came in were Cornelius Kinchelow, born 1760 in England, and his father, Hugh Kinchelow, who was born sometime between 1614 and 1647 in England by way of Ireland. So, so now we're all sitting in this room together, and they're all looking at us my, my son and I, and we're looking back at them. We don't say anything, but there's a sense of recognition in the room. And then I woke up. And the first thing I thought about when I woke up was, what if that were real? What if I would have the chance to sit in the same room as the 13 generations of my family? And what would I learn? What would I understand about myself about my son, about my history. And what, what would I get out of that experience? And I think really that's what people who write time travel stories are considering, is that question of what we have access to when we control time. What can we do with that experience? And how will that change us? And how will that affect us? And how can we right some wrongs or understand something better about ourselves or something more about ourselves. So let's talk a little bit about time travel. Um, excuse me. Uh, time travel narrative uh, has been a big part of science fiction fantasy literature for a really long time. And um, it's sort of, you know, I like to sort of think that the popularization of it started with one man, that's H.G. Wells. In 1895, he wrote a story called The Time Machine, where he imagined that a scientist had created the time travel science, so the time travel, a time travel device, a machine that could move him through time, and he sent himself into the future where he met two distinct species of, species of human-like creatures, one that was sort of lived subterraneously and was very carnivorous and ruthless and violent, and then another one that was the exact opposite, lived above the earth, lived on, excuse me, on the earth and was very passive and dependent on the, on the people that lived under the earth to survive. And really, um, you know, this is kind of, this was his opportunity to sort of write a thin, thinly veiled kind of social criticism about Victorian England at the time. Essentially, you know, there were two, um, two class, two distinct classes of people at that period of time, the aristocracy and the, the working class folks. And, um, he, he thought to sort of think about how if we were to project this out into the future and maintain this level of class stratification, it would split the, uh, the culture in such a way that we would become essentially two species of people. And so he used this opportunity to talk about his own reality um, in, a, in a critical way by projecting that reality out into the future. And so with that in mind, we sort of started a process of writing a lot of different time travel narratives. And these time travel narratives fall into sort of two buckets in my mind. There's the plastic timeline bucket um, and the fixed timeline bucket. And so the plastic timeline bucket imagines that you have the ability to travel through time and you can project yourself either direction, either back or forward. And the goal is to change something about your reality by changing something about the past. So you start in one time, you project yourself back, change something about that time, and then eventually something, you know, one thing leads to another, and you get a series of possible futures that lead to things like alternate realities and changing something about the, the basic nature of reality and the basic nature of what you understand as your present and your future. And then there's the fixed timeline. And the fixed timeline is pretty much the exact opposite. Essentially, you uh, 
it imagines time as kind of a fixed construct, that there is no way to change the nature of time or the series of events that lead to the reality that you understand and know. So you could project yourself anywhere on the timeline and do anything, but that thing that you did or that thing that you do or that thing that you will do becomes a part of the timeline as it already exists. So there's basically the timeline itself is already a fixed construct and you can't do anything to change it. So within these two um, structures of narrative, we get a lot of, uh, of authors writing about the concept of trauma and writing about what it's like to experience trauma and how the control of time could either allow us to affect trauma or could not. So let's start with the plastic timeline, talk a little bit about that. The plastic timeline has lots of different examples over the history of fiction. Um, the most popular, one of the most famous ones happen, is the Ray Bradbury story of Sound of Thunder from 1952. In this story, a series, a group of kind of thrill-seeking uh, adventurers decide that they're going to travel back in time on a hunting expedition and go and hunt a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Uh, a series of things end up happening, some shenanigans go down, one of them dies, and essentially they change the future or change their present to um, be something drastically different. And this story actually coined the famous term, the butterfly effect, which is um, kind of one of the most famous terms from the plastic timeline structure, which is that you change something small about uh, the past or something about your reality, and that will lead to more and more uh, things happening that will lead to something large being changed, something catastrophic perhaps being changed. So. Um, there's lots of different examples of these. Some of my favorites, I don't have time to talk about every single one of them, but some of my favorites are uh, the novel The First 15 Lives of Harry August by Claire North. Essentially, is kind of a, um, a Groundhog Day story wherein the main character, Harry August, lives his same life over and over again, but can change things because when he dies, doesn't matter where he dies or when he dies, he comes back to the moment where he was born, the same place in the same time, and he maintains the memories from his previous lives lived. So he's able to kind of move throughout his life and change things about the nature of his reality every single time. And so it kind of compounds on itself and um, then catastrophic things obviously ensue. So then there's the story Primer. It's a film from 2004. It was an independent film made by Shane Carruth. He actually stars in the film as well. And that's a story about two kind of uh, entrepreneurs that design a time travel device and essentially this film is very overly complicated for good reason because they constantly then once they create this time travel device they get in a war with each other where they're constantly kind of making new devices and then making multiple like versions of themselves and things just kind of go nuts so watch the film if you're interested but it's kind of um, all over the place to be honest and so the most famous one and perhaps the most popular one uh, is the 1985 film Back to the Future by Ro Robert Zemeckis. So in, in Back to the Future, we get the story of Marty McFly, who is a uh, teenager in 1985 who meets a uh, wily uh, mad scientist named Doc Brown, played by Christopher Lloyd, who actually, it's his birthday today, incidentally, I just found out. Um, and they, uh, he sends Marty back to 1955, where he's presented with the opportunity to change something about the nature of his present by, by developing a relationship between his mother and father, played by Crispin Glover and Leah Thompson. And one of the interesting things about this story and how it connects to trauma is that, you know, I really think about this story as kind of a, um, a meditation on what it means to, to uh, develop like the trauma of sexuality. So if we do a feminist reading of this story, um, Leah Thompson's character, who plays Marty McFly's mother, um, is kind of punished for having sexual feelings in the film. Um, she, when Marty is, is sent back to 1955, he meets his mother prior to her developing a relationship with his father, and she has sexual feelings for him. And this is, creates a very complicated uh, sort of series of events that happen that start to lead to his present being changed to the effect of him and his two siblings not existing anymore. And so this becomes the main problem of the story, is how is Marty going to solve this problem and, and get his existence back by somehow convincing his father 
to fall in love with his mother or to convince her to fall in love with him, and she becomes kind of the object of the story and rather than the subject. So it's kind of complicated and traumatic in that sense for her. And so we'll, the, the clip that we're gonna watch really tells, uh, it's the climax of the film when we see this kind of trauma come viscerally round in circle to Marty himself, and he has to uh, kind of go through this trauma in a visceral way. Can you get volume Except on this? The kiss is the first time on the dance floor, and if there's no music, they can't dance. If they can't dance, they can't kiss. If they can't kiss, they can't fall in love, and I'm history. Hey, man, the dance is over, <laughs> unless uh, you know somebody else that can play the guitar. This is for all you lovers out there. Okay, so as you can see, um, the whoops, as you can see, uh, the interesting thing about that particular story is how, um, you know, the McFly's mother becomes kind of the object of the story and has no agency, and that leads to kind of the trauma of exist, the, the, the existential trauma in a real way for uh, Marty. And um, I hope you recognize maybe some fans of Back to the Future out there recognize that my, my uh, graphic for, back, for Plastic Timeline is actually the story of, 19, of, uh, of the three films, um, or at least the first two of Back to the Future itself. So that's the Plastic Timeline. Let's talk about the Fixed Timeline, which is actually uh, the one that we'll be focusing on mainly today. So the Fixed Timeline, like I said, um, has, goes by, it, it is a sort of story of kind of time being a fixed construct, and therefore the trauma comes from trying to change that time or make choices within that timeline that you feel like are going to change things but then end up becoming part of that timeline in a sense. So you have a kind of different names for the fixed timeline. It's been known as the causal loop, the bootstrap paradox, which I'll talk about, the predestination paradox, and then um, considered, you know, kind of like the concept of being time being a flat circle. And so when we think about the uh, bootstrap paradox or the fixed timeline, there's a few different examples of this. Um, Star Trek did a great episode called The City on the Edge of Forever. Uh, there was a film by Ryan Johnson called Looper that deals with this. The film 12 Monkeys by Terry Gilliam from 95 is an example of fixed timeline. Time Crimes, which is a, span a Spanish film from 2007 is a really famous example of this. And then um, one of my favorite examples happens to be from the TV show Doctor Who, which is one of the more famous uh, television examples of time travel. 
Um, if you don't know Doctor Who, it's a British television show about an alien who has time travel abilities, uses a machine to kind of travel through time and space and save the world over and over again. Um, and he's been, he has been played by many different people. Actually, the 13th iteration of the Doctor is not a he, it's a she now, which is really interesting and actually fantastic. Um, and so in 2015, they wrote a couple episodes called Under the Lake and Before the Flood that deal with this fixed timeline construct. Um, and at the beginning of the episode, the doctor, played by Peter Capaldi, a Scottish actor, kind of tells the, the story of the bootstrap paradox for, for everyone. If we can get so the volume too, I'm not sure. Time machine. Up and down history he goes, zip, 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 getting into scrapes. Another thing he has is a passion for the works of Ludwig van Beethoven. And one day he thinks, What's the point of having a time machine if you don't get to meet your heroes? So, off he goes to 18th century Germany. But he can't find Beethoven anywhere. No one's heard of him. Not even his family have any idea who the time traveler is talking about. Beethoven literally doesn't exist. Oh, I'm sorry. This didn't happen, by the way. I've met Beethoven. Nice chap, very intense. Loved an arm wrestle. No, this is called the bootstrap paradox. Google it. The time traveler panics. He can't bear the thought of a world without the music of Beethoven. Luckily, he brought all of his Beethoven sheet music for Ludwig to sign. So he copies out all the concertos and the symphonies and he gets them published. He becomes Beethoven. And history continues with barely a feather ruffled. But my question is this. Who put those notes and phrases together? Who really composed Beethoven's fifth? <laughs> Don't forget to click below to subscribe to the official doctor. All right, got to get back into the presentation now. Um, so I don't know if we can get the sound to go up, but you know, it would be really, really great. And I have two more videos to play to the folks up, up above if, if we can get the sound to go up. Um, so, uh, because it was, well, now I realize uh, that the volume was, will, will make this part easier to stomach, is that I'm going to tell you what just happened. So <laughs> um, to kind of explain the bootstrap paradox from the perspective of how Dr. Tu who tells it, right? You have this guy who lives in our present, who's a lover of Beethoven, happens to be able to travel through time, he decides to go back in time and meet Beethoven. He brings the works of Beethoven with him to get signed. He comes back to late 18th century Vienna, and there is no Beethoven anywhere to be found. Nobody knows who he is. So he decides, instead of just going back to the present, he decides, well, everybody's got to live with Beethoven in the world, so I'm going to publish his work. And then he essentially becomes Beethoven, therefore creating the opportunity for him to love Beethoven in the present that he came from. So he essentially is both the cause and the effect of Beethoven as an artist and Beethoven as a member of, histor of history. And that's really where uh, the, the fixed timeline or the bootstrap paradox uh, kind of falls, is this element of, of us being, or the choices that we make, being both the cause and the effect. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about with the, in the context of the fixed timeline, which is that you know when we think about that, when we think about this loop element of time and how we have no control over it, some things start to happen that are, that are traumatic. And some experience, we start to deal with that in different ways in literature. And so one of the ways that's been dealt with is to kind of lose all control and to realize our sort of lack of agency entirely and to feel that trauma happening over and over again. And this is uh, uh, characterized in, uh, this is really uh, well characterized in the TV show True Detective, at least the first season of it, which starred Matthew McConaughey 
and Woody Harrelson. And Matthew McConaughey's character deals with this at a very real level. He, becomes, he sort of becomes obsessed with pessimistic philosophy and his lack of ability to control the trauma that, his, um, that the people that he saves from victimization go through. Why should I live in history, huh? Fuck, I don't want to know anything anymore. This is a world where nothing is solved. When someone once told me time is a flat circle. If everything we've ever done or will do, we're going to do over and over and over again. And that little boy and that little girl, they're going to be in their room again. And again, and again, forever. So, you could manage to get shot. So, as you can see, Russ Cole, uh, played by Matt McConaughey, is sort of lost in this sort of powerlessness that he has over this traumatic um, changing or this traumatic looping of, of, of time and how the experiences of, his, of the people that he saves will continue to happen, and that kind of consumes him. So this is one reaction to the fixed timeline. What's well, another one? Well, uh, one, of the famous, one, uh, one of the most famous writers who dealt with the fixed timeline is Robert Heinlein, who's a, a science fiction writer. And he, he wrote a lot of stories in the science fiction tradition, but um, I'd like to focus on a couple that sort of deal with this particular form of uh, of the time travel element. And so the first one is Bias Bootstraps, which is a short story from 1941. And Bias Bootstraps, I feel like, is when Robert Heinlein is really dealing with his own experience of the writing process. Perhaps he's been dealing with writer's block and he's not been able to invent anything. So the story uh, tells of a man who's sitting alone in a room toiling over his own creation of writing. And he's visited by his future self, who, who is there to sort of pull him up by his own bootstraps, in a sense, and um, help him, and convince him to work harder because he, the things that he is about to write are going to save the world. And so this element of kind of being both the cause and the effect is at play when you think about our kind of sense of motivation, our sense of invention when we, do, when we work on creative processes. And... Um, uh, Robert Heinlein sort of essentially made this real in the sense of kind of using time travel to articulate that. Now, All You Zombies is a story from 1958, which is really characterized, really kind of takes the fixed timeline or the bootstrap paradox to its kind of hyperbolic end, which is that um, it, the character in All You Zombies, you know, through a series of time travel uh, elements in the story, is essentially, not essentially, is literally every character in the story, is literally every character that they are, they are related to. So they are themselves, they are their mother, their father, and their daughter all at once. And it's a, it, that's just, we're ruining the story for you, so sorry, spoilers. But um, it is a fascinating way of kind of taking this fixed timeline structure and thinking about it existentially, thinking about it like, what does it mean to be alive? Can we create ourselves through, the, through, through this process of being all of the people we're related to all at once? And you can think of this, the way that this affects is, is uh, connected to trauma is through this element of how the story gets started. So the story gets started by um, the main character, well, first of all, the film was, I mean, the, the, the story was made into a film in 2015 called Predestination, starred Ethan Hawke. And the story starts in a bar where um, the character, the only character in the story, is sort of visited by this other version of himself and convinced, he doesn't know any of that information yet, but is, is sort of asked and propositioned with the ability to change some past trauma that he's experienced. And that gives him the opportunity or the choice, right? He has no choice, really, but the choice presents itself to change something about his life to make it better. And by doing that, he not only kind of uh, starts this process of kind of realizing his ultimate existential existence, which is that he is all of the people he is related to all, as, all at once, but... Um, but also kind of starts the process of creating this existential loop for himself. And so we'll see that moment now. 
What if I could put him in front of you? Huh? The man that ruined your life. And if I could guarantee you that you'd get away with it. Would you kill him? In a heartbeat. I know where he is. Yeah, of course you do. Nope. How the hell do you know that? Records. Hospital records, orphanage records, medical records. Been there, done that. Beth Featheridge. Isn't that the name of your caretaker at the orphanage? Beth? So what predestination and what All You Zombies does is it asks us, like, what if we were able to sort of change or affect this trauma that happened to us in our past? Would we be able to change our lives? Would we be able to understand something about ourselves? And what All You Zombies says is that that is a foregone conclusion that leads to trauma in and of itself, which is the trauma of realizing that you are all of the people all at once, and that that kind of creates this cause-effect loop that's very traumatic for the character. Now, you're probably asking yourselves 30 minutes into this presentation, how does this connect to Kindred? Um, well, I'm about to tell you. So Kindred uh, really, so the way I understand Kindred is that she, Butler, I should say, is working within the tradition of the fixed timeline, is working within the bootstrap paradox. And she's doing this to help us understand or to help her audience understand the relationship that we have to historical trauma and the understanding that we need to maintain about that historical trauma in order to move forward productively. And so she uses this element of like the illusion of choice and complicity in historical trauma to really tell the story of how we are all embedded within our own histories and that we have to become conscious of that in order to move forward and you can't seek to wipe it away. And so what do I mean by historical trauma? Well, in this context, I do mean the literal historical trauma of her mother being raped to create her, but I also mean the historical trauma of slavery and the historical trauma of, of the relationship between races in America and even the relationship between genders in America. And so how does she do this? Well, Dana, our main character, obviously being pulled back and forth through time um, within, you know, it develops a relationship with the character Alice, a slave, and the character Rufus, a slave owner. And she is complicit in the events that lead to her, uh, to Alice, right, and Rufus having a sort of violent encounter that then eventually leads to Dana's birth. And this complicity gives her the understanding or gives her this kind of experience of being both the cause and effect of her own existence through this lens of sexual violence and historical racial trauma, we get this experience. And so Butler puts her character in two situations where she's given a choice, a choice to either participate in this future trauma that then creates her or to not. And she doesn't have a choice. We all know that because she has to exist. Therefore, she has to make the choice to participate. But that complicity, that moment, makes her aware and makes her conscious of her own connection to the historical trauma that created her. So you have the moment with Alice where she's about to leave and go to stall Rufus and stop him from, from, from creating this, uh, this chain of events that lead to their encounter. And instead, she puts a seed in Alice's, memory, in Alice's mind that she doesn't want her to do that and she wants her to stay and she wants her to not, to not meddle, right? But by doing that, she puts the seed in her mind that then leads to the connection between Rufus and Alice. Same thing with Rufus. She's given an opportunity to get up to go and not participate in this relationship, but instead she stays and she puts a seed into Rufus's mind, reminding him of Alice and her existence and his relationship with her, and therefore creating a chain of events that lead to the encounter um, that leads to her birth. So, what do we learn from this? Well, first of all, Butler, we learn that Butler has a very personal reason for writing this story. She wanted to write the story 
to consider the relationship between generations of the black community. And she specifically said this in an interview that she gave when she, she reminded herself of the, uh, the germ that was the idea for Kindred, which was an encounter that she had with a member of the black power movement in the 1970s, who was saying that he hated the older generations, that he, dis that he, was, he was ashamed of their humility and their acceptance of this disgusting behavior of racism, and that he wanted, that, but that he realized inherently that by hating the people that participated in that in the past generations, he first had to hate his parents, and he first had to direct that toward the people that created him and the, the history that, that led to his birth. And so, obviously, Butler takes this idea and makes it literal, right? To sort of put us in this opportunity, in this moment of being literally complicit in our own existence, in our own birth, and that that birth and that that existence is rife with trauma, with racial trauma, with gender trauma, with sexual trauma. So um, we are kind of both the cause and effect of our own trauma, in a sense, is what she's kind of explaining and how we have to become conscious of that. So, so really, Kindred is a slavery story on three levels. Obviously, it's most noted, most uh, presently a story about the socio-political construct of slavery, the idea of taking, someone, taking someone's autonomy and agency, forcing them to work for you, things like that. And obviously we have that in the sort of historical element of, da of, of the relationship between Rufus and Alice and where she's sort of thrust back to historically. But then also it's a story about the slavery that we have to our own personal history and the traumatic loop of that personal history perhaps. That if we are not conscious and if we do not come to grips with our own existence and the history that led to our own existence, we are doomed to repeat that trauma. We are doomed to loop back through that trauma. And she really kind of puts us in that moment, in that experience with, with Dana. And, you know, it leads to this, um, this indelible kind of real visceral trauma, just like Marty McFly goes through where she literally loses part of her body. Now, it's also a story about time, obviously for the time travel element, but it's the story of being slaves to time. Being the kind of, right, if we imagine that time is the fourth dimension, which, is, which was sort of posited by Hermann Minkowski and then later by Albert Einstein, that time is a dimension outside of ourselves, that we exist within that dimension, but we have no control over that dimension, and therefore we are slaves to it. We, have, we are three-dimensional beings that manipulate and move through the three-dimensional world at will, but we have no control and therefore are drugged through the fourth dimension of time and are slaves to it. And so she's telling us that, we, that this, this experience of having no control over time and history and the socio-political ideas around slavery, we have to come to grips with them. We have to cope with them and we have to deal with them. And we have to experience them consciously in ourselves and to realize something about ourselves and our own participation and our own um, element of this and our own part, um, excuse me, our own role that we have to play in the traumatic experiences that create our reality. And so what we really learn from this story um, is articulated by the great ta Coates in that he says, we cannot understand slavery or any great injustice by thinking about the masses. We have to think about it in the experience of one person. And I think Butler's asking us or telling us that that one person is us first. It's the self. So we have to look within in order to solve injustices. We have to realize our role in that and be conscious of it and not try to wipe it away, not try to live in some post-racial world where we don't see where we don't see color and we don't see gender and things like that, because that simply wipes it away somehow That's, that leaves us doomed to repeat it in kind of a personal history traumatic loop. Instead, we have to become conscious of it and we have to work with it and we have to understand the role it's playing in our society and we have to think about our own role in it. And so after I woke up, 
from my dream. I walked into my son's room and I picked him up out of his crib and I looked at him and I thought about these questions. Am I, do I understand it? Am I gonna be able to explain to him his own history, his own participation in the reality that we've created in America? Is he, gonna, is he going to learn anything from that? Do I learn anything from that? And how do I learn something from that? And I looked at him, I looked him deep in his eyes, and I realized he already knew. Thank you. So I think we're going to, are we going to do questions or? Okay. Yeah, you can repeat the question. Right. Of course. Yeah, anybody? <laughs> yeah, Ed, of course. You mean, you, you look at the side of the eye, and you already accomplished the sort of Yeah, I was trying to be vague there on purpose. Uh, so Ed asked, excuse me, uh, whether or not my son had time, had time traveled in the end of that story. And uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, right? Because, you know, we, we think about the relationship that we have historically to the, you know, the things that led to our birth. And so I was, I was kind of half joking in the sense that, you know, my son has time traveled in a sense. He, ha he does come from a place and that place is all the people that led to him. And so he does at a, in a sense kind of understand at an inherent level the, um, you know, the experience or the history that he lives in. He just has to kind of be conscious of that, I guess, is kind of the point there. Does that make sense? I don't know. Yes. Right. So she asked about Dana's uh, own consciousness and whether or not she's uh, like sort of aware of this of the the. Right. I don't think you know. Uh, she, she, she asked again about the understanding that she had of time travel uh, at the end of the story or throughout the story. And uh, I think that, you know, I don't think she fully understands it. I think that she is sort of ripped back and forth, right? And that's sort of supposed to be a metaphor for the historical trauma of slavery and the historical trauma of race relations in America. And that she's left with kind of this visceral, like physical trauma at the end of the story. So whether or not she's aware of it, I don't know. But I think Butler using this character as kind of going through this is a message more to the audience rather than to the awareness of the character, perhaps. I think that um, her character serves as the every person in the sense, is, is my idea about the story, is that she serves as kind of a, a wake, an awakening for us, the audience, rather than um, the, for Dana herself, perhaps. Is my idea, I don't know. But maybe people have other ideas. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Of Sure. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for saying that. She just said that the, uh, the verbiage that we use, and perhaps that goes right in with what I'm talking about in the sense of the consciousness around slavery as a socio-political construct, right? That no one can be a slave but is rather enslaved, is rather the object of a forceful action, right? That we need to come, come to grips with, right, as a society, rather than to sort of consider um, the identity of people as slaves, that they are never sort of identify themselves that way, but rather are projected or, or forced into that experience. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Robert. Yeah. Do I have any 
you thought? So he asked about the incongruous time uh, changes in the story. So when, when, um, when Dana's pushed back, she might spend a year back in 1814 and then spend, uh, you know, and then come back and realize only a couple minutes had passed since she left back to her present in Oakland. And I, I, um, my thoughts about it are that it's just adding to these layers of the trauma of time and the kind of like being ripped back and forth is a very jarring experience on multiple levels. Obviously, you know, she's pulled back in, you know, in the middle of, of things and kind of loses consciousness and things like that. So it's a very physically traumatic experience, but it's also very kind of consciously traumatic and, and sort of traumatic on a mental sense because she can't sort of imagine her own like her own position within uh, a, the timeline that she's living in. She's sort of left in, and so it adds this layer, I think, to uh, the trauma that Butler's trying to project onto her character in that, you know, she has lack, she, the, the lack of control uh, over time, kind of, um, not over time, like in terms of a process, but over time as a general idea, right, is, is multi-leveled. Multi and it's like these, these kind of, um, multiple layers of, of, of uh, the pain and, and trauma of being kind of moved through time without control, without her own agency, I think, right? Yeah. Abby. Yeah, you know, my, my, my dad and I have actually discussed that once and, and kind of thinking about, you know, what our position in, because I think, you know, at some level, all of, uh, you know, all people that have this kind of rich history in American, in, in American life, right, like, uh, like my family does, have, have some arm in the slave trade or in the socio-political construct of American slavery and so I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, maybe that's something I'm trying to develop in myself is my own consciousness of that, you know, and to realize kind of the, yeah, the places that my family have come from, right, have passed through and have been present in these moments of our history that, that Dana herself experiences. And so kind of, you know, using this novel as a metaphor for my own life, perhaps on the side, perhaps on um, Dana's boyfriend's side, who I can't remember, Tim? Kevin, Kevin excuse me, yeah. Perhaps on his side rather than on on Dana's side, of course, but uh, to realize kind of the the experience of that and what where where that puts me in, in historically. But yeah, that was that was kind of part of why I wanted to tell that story for sure. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right, and it, it, it really does speak to, I think, Butler's ideas about, about race and about the, the, the existence of certain races in America and our existence that, you know, whiteness kind of gives this universality to power, right, and that power kind of exists in every time period for, for whiteness and that, but for, you know, people of color, that experience is very different depending on the time that they're in and very, you know, a lot more wrought, wrought with kind of uh, these elements of, of, of the power dynamic as being projected onto them as sort of powerless, powerlessness, right? And that, that kind of movement through time is a lot more traumatic for Dana than it is for Kevin because of that, because of that power element. Right, and I think Butler might be speaking to that in that experience of Kevin, that he doesn't, you know, right, he can be powerful in any time that he's projected into in American history because of his whiteness, perhaps. Oh, in the back, sorry. Oh, please, of course.
the reasons why they choose a plastic timeline versus a fixed timeline? Wow. Um, I don't know. That would be getting into the mind of the author a little bit more than I'm capable of. But, you know, I think it was the question, perhaps, you know, it might come down to, um, so she asked about whether, why, why an author would choose to write in the plastic or fixed and why they would move, whether or not they would move back and forth. And I think maybe they would. I don't know any example off the top of my head about that, but they might, um, you know, it depends on the question they want to answer in their own writing, I think. Ooh. Well, a lot of my examples of fixed come from more, cur more current uh, films, you know, 2012's Looper, 2007 Time Crimes. The, the story of kind of, you know, it, it, can't, it can happen in terms of the historical moment. Can we change things, right? Is it right to try and change things in our own, in our own history? Um, or rather, right, like I sort of argue that uh, we should simply work with, the, work, work with the reality that we're given and try, you know, and that the meddling within that historical experience can only seek to make it worse, you know? And so maybe authors in the more current era thinking from, and especially in Butler, her own experience, you know, thinking that there is no control, no power over the time because of, you know, her um, position and her experience as uh, a black American can be that element of trying to write within this story where you have no control over that and you are kind of conflicted in it in a sense. And so maybe it comes from the identity of the author, maybe it comes from the question that they want to ask and or that they want to answer in their novel or in their story. But, um, but yeah, that's a hard question. I appreciate it though. Right, exactly. I'm sorry, you had a question as well. Oh. <laughs>